Good morning. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> so we've got a new unit now. We're doing uh, starting on work and energy. So a new way of uh, solving problems. Um, and it works in some cases where our old methods don't work. So that's kind of nice. So we'll, uh, we'll start in with work. Let's take a look at this, uh, at this situation, this example. <clears throat> a car traveling to the right with speed V breaks to a stop in a distance D. What's the work done on the car by the friction force, <clears throat> assuming the forces are constant. I know we haven't started talking about it yet. This is sort of a pre-quiz. Pre Okay, I'm going to stop it now. <clears throat> so uh, the people, almost everybody said um, force times distance in some way. Some said uh, number one, some said number two. <clears throat> Let's take a look at those. You're leaning in the right direction. That's good. So um, what we've got here is the displacement of the car. The car is moving to the right. but the force of friction has to be to the left in order to slow the car down. <clears throat> and so when we put the tails of these two vectors together, there's an angle there of 180 degrees. And what we're gonna see in a minute is that the work depends on the dot product between the force and the displacement. So we get a cosine of 180 in there, we get a negative work done. So it's the force times the distance and we get a cosine of 180. And that works because the force is constant. Okay, let's take a look at this in a little more detail. So we've got, uh, we're gonna push our box across the floor. And it's some, uh, for some distance. So what's the work done on the box by our pushing force? It's just the force times the distance because the force is constant and in the same direction we're moving. Force times the distance. Since F is constant and in the same direction as the displacement. <clears throat> now you see why I was hesitant to use the symbol W for weight in our free body diagrams. We've got a W now for work. So um, just be careful if you like to use W for weight, 
is also a W for work now. So make sure you know which is which. Okay, let's, let's make it a little more interesting. Let's push at an angle. So we've got our block. And we're gonna push And that block is going to slide the distance D to the right. So what do you think the work done on our box is now by our pushing force? Okay, so let's draw a free body diagram for our box. We've got what a normal force. Um, <clears throat> let's ignore friction in this case. All we care about is our pushing force. So we've got uh, the weight. And we've got our pushing force, which we can break up into an FX and an FY, right? FY. So really, this is the one that's doing work, right? The, the force in the Y direction isn't making the box go faster or slower. It's not doing anything to the motion of the box. It's not doing any work on the box. Only the component in the X direction is doing work on the box. So that's one way to think of it. So the work done is gonna be F sub X times the distance or F cos theta times the distance. So in general, let's come up with a general formula here. Well, not completely in general, because this is for constant forces. <clears throat> okay, we'll introduce non-constant forces very soon. The work done is a dot product So that means that it's the force, the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together. So if delta X points in this direction and the force points in this direction, you put their tails together and whatever angle you get, that's the one you use for the cosine theta. Work is, um, work is a transfer of energy. So it has the same units as energy. And those are joules. <clears throat> okay, so joule is our unit for energy. Work is just energy transfer, has the same units as energy. And it is a scalar quantity. Energy is a scalar quantity, no direction associated with it. All right, let's take a look at this one, see if, uh, see if we've got this. <clears throat> a car travels with constant velocity for a distance D up a hill. Uh, what is the work done? by the sum of the gravitational force plus the constant upward frictional force that the hill exerts on the tires of the car.
What's the work done? <clears throat> work done by the sum of the gravitational force and the friction force. Actually, let's uh, stop, 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 and I'm uh, ending the poll. Uh, let's just do the uh, gravitational force first. What's the work done by F sub G, the gravitational force, okay? Here it comes. What's the work done by F sub G? Same five choices. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, that's good. That's correct. What do we have? Let's um, let's take a look at that. We've got the car going up the hill. So our displacement is in what direction? Our displacement is in this direction. Force of gravity is in this direction. And so the work done by gravity is mg times the distance times the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together. I'm going to call this a different angle because they used uh, the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together. That's this angle right here. And what is that angle? It's 90, let's look at our drawing here. It's 90 plus theta. And the cosine of 90 plus theta is sine Theta, I believe. So the work done is, uh, is sorry, negative sine theta. Is that right? <clears throat> negative sine theta. So the work done is, uh, is this. Now, another way to think of it, maybe this is the way you thought of it, is to break up the force into components, right? So this is, this is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is to say our displacement is this way. Our force of gravity is this, but we're going to break that up into an mg cos theta and an mg sine theta. And then what do I get? I get the work done is uh, mg sine theta times delta x times the cosine of the angle you get. I need another symbol now. What am I going to use? How about beta? Where beta is, is the angle you get when you put these two together, right? You have to remember uh, just because it says theta doesn't mean it's the angle with the incline, right? It's whenever you see a dot product, the cosine of that angle comes from when you put the two tails together of your vectors. So in this case, our two vectors are mg sine theta 
and delta x. So when we put their tails together, we get 180 degrees. And that gives us a negative one. So we get minus mg sine theta delta x. So it doesn't matter which, which method you use. You could leave gravity as one force and use it that way. You can break it up into the components and say the, uh, the component perpendicular to the motion isn't doing any work. Only the component parallel to the direction of motion does work. Either way. Ah, question, good question about directions and signs. Uh, it says, do we have to use the cosine theta? Can't we, don't we know that uh, the, the delta x is in the positive direction and the mg sine theta is in the negative direction? The answer is you have to use the cosine theta. Uh, this is a, work is totally independent of your choice of coordinate system. You can choose up the in incline as positive. You can choose down the incline as positive. Doesn't matter. We all should get the same answer for work done. It only depends on the relative direction of your two vectors you care about. There's a dot product of those two vectors. <clears throat> so if these two vectors have components in the same direction, they have any, if they share any component in the same direction, the work done is positive. If they have components in opposite directions, in other words, the angle is more than 90 degrees when you put their tails together, then the um, work done is negative. <clears throat> okay, we okay with this one? What was the answer? <laughs> Oh, no, that's not the answer. Sorry. The answer to this one was number two. Work done by gravity. So there's another, another trick we can use here. And that is that if work is being done on an object, its energy has to change. It has to be going faster or slower. We have to be changing its energy. And what we will learn very soon is that energy of motion has to do with speed. So if the object is speeding up or slowing down, we are doing work on that object. And, and you might be able to look at every individual force. So if I push a box across the room, but the box just moves at a constant speed across the room, I know if the box's speed is not changing, I know there's no net work being done on that box. But I'm pushing it. I'm putting a force in and pushing it. So my pushing force is doing positive work on the box. If it was the only force acting on the box, the box would be speeding up. But there are other forces acting on the box. There's friction with the floor. So as the box moves in one direction, friction pushes in the other direction, and friction would be doing negative work on the box because they're in opposite directions. So you can look at each individual force acting on something. Some might be doing positive work, some might be doing negative work, some might not be doing any work. You can add them all up and you get the net work done on the object. So in this case, that's where we're, where we're, yeah, that's where we're headed. Okay, we've got a car going up a hill and it's going up the hill at constant velocity. And we know that the, uh, there's a force pushing it up the hill, right? The friction force is pushing it up the hill. And we know gravity is pulling down the hill. And so we want to know what's the net work being done on this box by the sum of those two forces. Okay, that's the question. I'll launch the poll.
Okay, most people are there, um, but we're just uh, just uh, 10 minutes into work and energy. So not everybody's there yet, that's fine. We're, we're getting there, moving in the right direction. Um, so of course this uh, object is, um, <clears throat> is moving at constant speed, it tells us, right? You have to be careful when you read these problems, constant speed. So that means that there can't be any network being done on it. And the only two ob forces that are acting on it in the direction of motion are the friction force up the incline and gravity down the incline. So they would have to be doing the sum of the work done by those two forces would have to be zero because it's, uh, it's moving at constant speed. So let's take a look at, uh, at that in a little more detail. So let's do the car. For the car. And, uh, and what do we get? We have our two choices here. I've already drawn it, right? We've got our, uh, our incline is like this. So we've got a force up the incline. That's our uh, friction force with the road, right? The tires are pushing against the road and the road is pushing against the tires, causing the car to go up the incline. We have a normal force and we have gravity. Or we can split up our force of gravity into perpendicular and parallel components, right? So we've got our incline that's uh, sort of at that angle and we've got our force up the incline, our normal force, oops, what did I do? We've got our mg cosine theta, mg sine theta. <clears throat> so now let's, let's do, help me fill in this table. I'm gonna list all the forces acting on our object and you're gonna come up with the work done on the car by that force. So what are they? There's the normal force. There's our force up the incline causing the car to go up the incline. And there's gravity. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna add them up. Okay. <clears throat> work done by the normal force. That's what we're doing. We're filling in our table, finding the work done on the car by the normal force. Okay, so what do we get? Work done on the car by the normal force. So let's do it here. Work done by the normal force on the car is going to be the normal force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle we get when we put their tails together. And what angle do we get? 
90 degrees, right? Because we've got a displacement up the incline, normal force, and what angle is that? That's a 90 degree angle, right? Zero. The normal force does no work. It's not making this object go faster. It's not making it go slower. It's not changing its motion at all. It's not changing its energy at all. That's it. Okay, how about our force F up the incline? Work done by F. It's F times the displacement times the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together. And what angle is that? zero degrees. F and delta X point in the exact same direction. This is the put the force up the incline, not gravity. Gravity is next. <laughs> okay, so what is this? This is just uh, F times the distance. I think we, I think they said it was small d was the distance it goes. Now gravity, work done by gravity. And so a couple of different ways, I would write it as the force of gravity times the displacement times the cosine of 90 plus theta, right? Because we have the delta x and gravity and this angle here. And so this is negative, I'm running out of room here. Hmm. Sneak in some more room somewhere. This is minus mg <clears throat> okay all right so think about the angles carefully with dot products it's the angle between the two vectors when you put their tails together <clears throat> maybe it's related to the angle of the incline or some other angle maybe it isn't okay now we add them all up and what do we get? We get uh, zero plus FD minus MGD sine theta. Now we say that that has to be zero because the speed is not changing. <clears throat> and so we get uh, the work done by the pushing force up the incline has to equal, uh, be equal and opposite to the work done by gravity down the incline because the net work done had to be zero. So that, is, that brings us to our uh, two, two other things we have to define right now. One is kinetic energy. And this is energy of motion. 
we use a K for kinetic energy, energy of motion. So if something is moving, it has kinetic energy. If it's moving faster, it has more kinetic energy. Uh, so how do we figure out kinetic energy? It's this formula, one half mv squared. So there's our kinetic energy. And um, we have a work kinetic energy theorem. And that tells us that the, uh, the sum of all the work done, the net work done, is equal to the change in kinetic energy. That's a capital K. Okay, so we've already been using this one a little bit, even though we didn't know what kinetic energy was. Work kinetic energy theorem. <clears throat> the net work done on an object, right? The sum of all the work done by all the forces acting on the object equals the change in kinetic energy of the object. Okay, let's do, uh, <clears throat> let's do an example. We've got a box. We're going to pull it. Some pulling force, uh, some angle here, some distance. <clears throat> so uh, Let's make it 100 newtons, um, 60 degrees, 10 kilograms, and uh, 5 meters. Oh, and let's have friction. Coefficient of friction, 0 0.2. <clears throat> so what we're going to do, we're going to find the work done by every force acting on the box. and the network done on the box. Okay. <clears throat> uh, question about uh, kinetic energy and work, are they related to acceleration? Not exactly, because there's no time component here, right? We don't care about time when we're doing energy and work. So we can't get acceleration, but we can get change in velocity. So there are a lot of times when you see a problem, we get our favorite problem. What's our favorite problem? This one, right? So when you see a problem like this, and the question says, what's the acceleration? Or what's the tension? You should be thinking Newton's laws, F equals MA. Because that formula has forces and acceleration in it, right? That's a good way to go. If it says, What's the velocity, if I release this thing from rest, what's the velocity the split second before M2 hits the ground? Then you should be thinking energy, right? You could, you could 
find the acceleration first using F equals MA, then use your kinematics equations to get the final velocity. But you could just do the problem one time and use energy and get the final velocity that way. But you won't get acceleration from energy. Okay, good. So what we're going to do, uh, you're going to draw a free body diagram first for this box. And then we're going to make a little table here of every force acting on the box. And the work done by that force on the box. So first free body diagram. Okay, we go okay with that free body diagram. <clears throat> so let's make a list now. We've got a normal force. We've got uh, force of gravity. We've got uh, our pulling force or pushing force, whatever it is, pulling force. And we have uh, friction. Let's start with the normal force. Okay, we've got the normal force times the distance times the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together. And that's going to be the cosine of 90 degrees. So this is zero. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero. We've got our displacement in this direction, our normal force in this direction. And that is 90 degrees, OK? <clears throat> when would the normal force do work? If it has a horizontal component? Yes, if it's, it will, if it's in the direction of motion, if it's in the direction of the displacement. So when would that be? When you're in an elevator, maybe, right? If you're standing in an elevator, the normal force, all of a sudden the elevator starts pushing up on you, that normal force is in the same direction as your displacement. Then the normal force is doing work. But if the normal force is not 
does not have any component in the direction of motion, in the displacement direction, then it does no work. So when boxes are sliding across surfaces, things like that, then the normal force does no work. It That's to, true for any force, right? Any force, yeah. It has to have a component in the direction of the displacement, yes. Gravity, work done by gravity. The force of gravity times the displacement times the cosine of What's that angle? 90 degrees. <clears throat> okay. Gravity is doing no work in this case. Okay, another example is uh, you have a big suitcase, you're getting ready to go on a trip. You grab the suitcase, you stand up, you lift it up off the floor. Did you just do work on the suitcase? Yes, right, you lifted it up, you, you applied a force to it and it moved in that direction, you did work on it. Now you stand there and you're standing there holding the suitcase, you're not moving, you're just standing there holding the suitcase. Are you doing any work on the suitcase? No, you're applying a force to it, you're holding it up, you're getting tired, <laughs> but you're not doing any work. So you may have noticed, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I'm very careful when I talk about work done, or at least I try to be, and I say the work done by some force, right, on some object, the work done by gravity on the box, the work done by friction on the box, I try to be very careful when I say it that way. It's your muscles might be internal to your body biologically using energy when you're standing holding something heavy, but from a physics standpoint, you have to be doing work on something. And that something's energy has to change. If you're not, if you're doing work on it, its energy has to change. Holding something in position is not changing its energy. So just uh, a physics, you got to think in a physics term when we're talking about work done. Okay, you got the next one filled in here. Work done by our pulling force, F. Because why are we using these, this simple formula? Because all these forces are constant. All these forces are constant over the distance that we're talking about here. So because they're constant, we can just use the force times the distance times the cosine of the angle between them. If the forces were changing, we would have to integrate them. We're gonna do that soon enough. <clears throat> so the force times the displacement times the cosine of the angle when we put their tails together. So let's see what they look like when we put their tails together. I'm running out of room here. So the um, displacement is this way. And the pulling force is this way. And there is an angle of 60 degrees there, I think. And so if we plug in the numbers, I believe that comes out to 250 or close enough. Not Newtons. What are my units? Joules, 250 joules. And friction, are you ready for friction? 
work done by the friction force. It's the friction force times the displacement times the cosine of what angle? What is my friction force? It's mu times the normal force and cosine of 180 is negative one. So you have to find the normal force. I'll do it over here. Find So what do we, how do we get the normal force? We look at this direction, right? That gives us the, the normal force when we look at the perpendicular direction to motion. So we say the sum of the forces in that direction, sum of the forces in the perpendicular direction have to be zero. The normal force plus F sine theta minus mg is zero. So the normal force is mg minus F sine theta, 11.4 is <clears throat> what I got. Uh, force of mg is 90 degrees. So <laughs> you have to throw away the 90 degree, the zero degrees is in the positive x direction. Get rid of that. That will kill you in physics. <laughs> we, in physics, we're dealing with the real world. We're dealing with uh, situations, cars going up hills, box sliding down inclines, things moving over pulleys. You pick a coordinate system that makes sense for the problem, okay? You define what the positive direction is. You define where zero is. Throw away this idea that zero is to the right or positive is to the right or that kind of thing. This formula we're using, this is an important point. This formula, let me make more room here. I need more room. This is good. A lot of people get stuck on this, so I'm glad this question was asked. <clears throat> um, this formula, dot product formula, uh, A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle you get when you put their tails together, okay? So if A points this way and B points this way, what way should we have? Okay, what is theta? It doesn't matter what you call zero. It doesn't matter what you've learned in math classes before. Theta is this angle. When you take A and B and you put them together, Is that B? I'm trying to copy B over here. Kind of, sort of. When you put them together, this is theta. Okay? The angle you get when you put those tails together, that is theta. That's the cosine. We're taking that angle here. So let's go back and look at these real quick. For the displacement is always 
this direction, right? The box is sliding to the right. That's our displacement that's given in the problem. That's this vector right here, right? The box is sliding to the right. So in each one of my drawings here, you can see my displacement goes to the right. That's one of my vectors. Then I look at the other one, normal force. Normal force goes up. So I add, put that here. And what angle do I get when I put those tails together? I get 90 degrees. What angle do I get when I do that for gravity? I get gravity down. I get 90 degrees, right? It's the angle you get when you put the tails together. All right. Good. <clears throat> excellent, excellent. Clearing up sticking points. All right, so what have we just done? We found the, the work done by each of the forces acting on our box as it slides across the floor. Now what are we going to do? We're going to add them up and come up with the work, the net work done. Zero, zero. Positive 250, negative 11.4. So we ended up with a positive 238.6 joules. Now, if our object started from rest, how fast is it going at the end of those five meters? So this is where we use our work kinetic energy theorem. The net work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And we just found the net work done. So that's going to be, what is delta is always final minus initial. So the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. And what is kinetic energy? It's one half m v squared, so this is going to be v final squared, and one half m v initial squared. And we said it starts from rest. So we get a one half the mass v final squared has to equal 238.6, and I got v final 6.9 meters per second. Okay. All right. Um, why don't we take a 10 minute break, come back at five after, and then we will uh, continue with work and energy. Okay, during the break, I was thinking about this question that came up earlier about the angle, and uh, I don't think I answered the question. <laughs> I think I answered a different question. Um, so I think the question is, 
Hold on just a second. Come on. Where is it? I think the question is, when you put their tails together, you get two different angles. Is that the question? So you've got a vector this way. You've got a vector this way. And this is one angle. But there's also this other angle, right? <clears throat> Which one do you use? I think that might have been the question. Uh, I think the answer is it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, th I think the cosine of both of those is the same. But um, I always pick the angle less than uh, 180 because it, it's more meaningful to me. I don't know when angles become uh, kind of like doing sines and cosines. When I'm taking sines and cosines, I try to always pick an angle you know, less than uh, 90 degrees or definitely less than 180 because it helps me pop, uh, it helps me um, uh, think about what the opposite is, what the adjacent is, what's going on. When the angles start to go beyond a certain amount, then it doesn't make as much physical sense to me. So uh, from a math perspective, it's the same thing, right? Uh, it doesn't matter. But from, uh, from kind of a picturing what's going on and, and seeing the physics and understanding what the force is doing, I think always pick the angle that's less than 180. Okay, I think that might have been the question. <clears throat> okay. Let's do, let's talk a little bit more about uh, forces and work done. So again, you know, we got to think in terms of physics definitions. So let's uh, let's think about what happens when we when we lift weights. At the gym. <coughs> so you got a uh, barbell <clears throat> and uh, and you push on it and it moves up, right? It moves up by some distance delta y. And so uh, let's, let's say we, we lift the barbell at constant speed. If we lift the barbell at constant speed, draw a free body diagram. Okay, if you lift at constant speed, you are applying some force to this barbell. You're lifting it up. And what other force is being applied to the barbell? Gravity, right? And uh, what do we know if, we, the, if the barbell is moving at constant speed? Those two forces have to be equal to each other. So the work done. This is going to be, hold on, hold on. This is going to be the uh, work done by you on the barbell. If we're lifting at constant speed, the work done on the way up is, what is it? force times displacement times cosine zero degrees
mg times delta y. You okay with that? What's next? Now you're going to lower the barbell, right? Okay, free body diagram, what does it look like? It looks exactly the same, right? Gravity is pulling it down, but it's coming down at constant speed because you're pushing up on it, right? So the work done on the way down is F times delta Y times what? You're pushing up on the barbell, but the barbell is moving down, right? So you're doing negative work on the barbell. Your force is making the barbell go slower than it would normally. So you're doing negative work on the barbell. We could say the barbell is doing positive work on you. That's another way of saying that. Okay, so how much work did you do at the gym? You didn't do any work at the gym. Because if you did work at the gym, something's energy would have had a change. When you go to the gym, all the weights are in the racks. You pick them up, you lift them, you put them back. They're right back where they started, at the same height, at the same speed. You didn't change their energy at all. So from a physics perspective, you did no work. Okay? If you did work on something, its energy had to have changed. <clears throat> if you go to the gym and you lift all the weights up off the floor and put them on tables and leave, then you did work, right? You lifted the weights up, but you didn't put them back down. But uh, if the weights are back in the same place when you leave as they were when you started, then you did no work from a physics perspective, right? On the boxes, on the weights. We're talking about, you have to get in the habit of thinking, get in the habit of thinking about work done by some force on some object, work done by you on the weights, okay? Certainly your muscles were stressed, you used energy, uh, things happened inside your body that are good for you, but, um, you didn't do weight, any net work on the weights at the gym. Okay, let's do this one. Satellite traveling around the earth at constant speed as it moves, uh, uh, how much work is done by the gravitational force on the satellite after it travels around the earth in a time T?
Okay, so um, the work would be zero because uh, the force of gravity is always toward the center of the earth, right? As this object moves around, the force of gravity would be this way, but the displacement, the velocity, right, is in that direction. And then when the satellite's over here, the force of gravity is in this direction, and the velocity, the displacement, the direction it's moving is in that direction. And so as it goes around, they are always 90 degrees apart from one another. So you get a cosine 90 degrees. The force is always perpendicular to the displacement. Okay, let's take a look at a few cases here. Uh, the first thing we looked at, one of the first things we looked at was a box sliding across the floor. So we have, uh, we have our box, we have a force, 100 Newtons, and it's going some distance, five meters, right? And so let's take a look. If we plot our force and our distance, the area here is uh, 500 uh, Newton meters. And that happens to be the work done, right? <clears throat> the work done by our pulling force on our box. Now let's take a look at uh, At this situation, we've got our box uh, sliding to the right, but our force is in the other direction. So the box is moving to the right, the force is to the left, maybe it's a friction force, maybe it's something slowing it down, we're pulling on it to slow it down. So what would this look like if we plotted it? Leave a little more space here. It would look like this, right? The area would be uh, negative 500 Newton meters, <clears throat> and that's the work done. Can something moving with constant velocity have a network being done on it? Uh, no. No, if there's network being done, kinetic energy has to be changing. Speed has to be changing. Uh, these are two different scenarios. In one case, uh, we're pulling to the right. In the other case, we're pulling to the left. But in both cases, the object is moving to the right.
Okay. Now uh, you're getting the picture here. The force versus displacement curve, the area under that curve tells us the work done. So if I give you you can find the work done. Let me do that. So we'll, we'll use this one, F. X. Five. 100. So now my force is not constant anymore, right? As, as my object moves, it starts out, there's no force acting on it. As it moves, there's a small force acting on it, then a bigger force, then a bigger force, then a bigger force. As the object moves, the force changes, the force increases. So this is a situation like this. We've got a box moving five meters to the right, but our force is a function of x, right? It's not constant. So what's the work done on my box? Okay. And you can see here what's happening with work. Work is a force, newtons, through a distance, meters, newton meters. And we get tired of writing newton meters all the time. <clears throat> so we call that a joule. So a newton meter is equal to a joule. Where did I have that earlier today? Units, we're not talking about units. <clears throat> Newtons times meters is a joule. Okay, let's do this one. Let's see how we're doing. It says the engine of a 1000 kilogram sports car rotates the tires creating a forward pushing force F on the tires that varies as a function of distance. The force is shown below. If it starts at rest, what is the speed of the car? at the end of 500 meters.
Okay. Let's take a look here. Um, looks like the majority got it right. That's good. What are we going to do? We're going to use our work kinetic energy theorem, right? We're going to find the network done. How can we get that? Well, we're given a nice graph of force versus displacement, right? Force versus distance. So we will use our work kinetic energy theorem. <clears throat> we'll get the network from the area. <clears throat> and our change in kinetic energy, one half m v final squared minus one half m v initial squared. It said it started from rest. So <clears throat> what do we get here? We get uh, 2,500,000 is equal to one half. The mass was given. It's just a triangle, right? One half base times height. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's a triangle. One half base times height, area of a triangle. Um, M is 1,000, right? That's what it is here, M 1,000. And so what do we get? 71, I think. It's given. <clears throat> the force and the distance are given. We're okay with that? Okay, so what gives us a force that looks like this? Well, springs do. So let's take a, an example here. We've got a spring. hanging here. <clears throat> so we'll call that sort of the, the unstretched length of the spring, right? It's just hanging there, no weight hanging on it. That's its, its unstretched length. Now we're going to put a weight on there. <clears throat> so it stretches a little bit, right? <clears throat> stretched by some amount here. Let me just put a Now let's put a bigger weight on there double
okay? So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> in, in the first case, there's no weight there. This, that's our natural length of our spring. In the middle one, we've got a mass M hanging there. What's the spring force equal to? What force is the spring exerting on our box if it's hanging there? The net, we know the net force on the box is zero. What, what's the spring force? Equals the weight, right? F spring has to equal mg if the box is just hanging there because the net force was zero, correct. Now, how about the last case here? What's the spring force in this case? <clears throat> it's also equal to the weight of the box, right? It's just hanging there. Gravity's pulling down. The box is not going down, it's just hanging there, so something must be pulling up with an equal and opposite force, and that's the spring force. So this one has twice as much, right? 2mg. So for most springs, this is the relationship we see. The spring force is proportional to the distance that the spring is stretched or compressed. In this case, it's stretched. And this is called Hooke's Law. The spring force is equal, is proportional to the displacement. And that proportionality constant is uh, the spring, that's a lowercase k. I know it's obvious the way I drew it, but be careful when you're drawing them. <laughs> that's a lowercase k, that's the spring constant. Capital K is kinetic energy, but it should be, uh, you know, from the situation, you should be able to tell what they are, right? If you're familiar with, uh, with the equations and how to use them. This is a spring constant. It depends on the spring, right? Some springs are really easy to stretch and compress. Those would have a small K, a small spring constant. And some springs you have to put a really big force in, right? They're hard to stretch and compress. Those would have a large K, a large spring constant. Now, a lot of books write it as a vector equation. I, I just think that's kind of confusing. The spring force as a vector is minus k times the displacement as a vector. <clears throat> because if you stretch the spring, if you displace it in one direction, what direction is the force? The spring pulls back in the opposite direction. So you get that minus sign there if you write it as a vector equation. I usually just write it as the magnitude. And then I look at the situation. I know when a spring is stretched, it's pulling back towards its equilibrium position. And when I, a spring is compressed, it pushes back towards its equilibrium position, right? I can figure out the direction from that usually. Uh, and I, I typically just use Hooke's Law as a magnitude, to find the magnitude of the spring force is K times the displacement. But a lot of books write it as the vector equation. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, can you think of uh, a situation where you would not want a spring that obeyed Hooke's law? I always tell my students they should sleep on it tonight and then we can talk about it next time. That was a hint. Yes, yes. Bed springs. Because if your bed springs behave like Hooke's Law springs, what would happen? Big, heavy parts of your body would sink way down into them in order to get enough force to hold them up. And light parts of your body, like your arms and legs, would hardly push in at all to get the force needed. So your body would end up, your legs would be up here and your 
your torso would be down here and your head may be here and your arms would be up like that and it wouldn't be a very comfortable way to sleep. So what do they do? They make them where the initial you know, inch or two is really small case so that it's nice and soft. You push on it. Oh, it feels good when you get in there. But then as soon as you start to go beyond that, the value of the spring constant really kicks up fast so that the big heavy parts of your body don't sink super low into the bed. And I don't know, I think they have fancy ways of coiling the springs and that to, to make that happen. But here's a real simple way if you wanted to achieve that, you could just use two springs, right? You have one spring that's this, and you have a second spring, I'll use a red, that's taller and inside the other one. So this is K1 and this is K2. And then if you plot the spring constant, force versus distance, <clears throat> it starts out over this first distance here as that spring gets compressed, it's, it's small, right? It's nice and linear. And then what happens? The second spring kicks in and it looks something like that, right? So here's the one spring and then over this distance you have the uh, Two springs. So the slope of that line is the spring constant, right? Force versus displacement. The slope is k. <clears throat> and and uh, that's one way to find it. If you have a spring in the lab, you can hang weights on it and measure the displacement and make a graph. And the slope of that graph is the spring constant for the spring, if it obeys Hooke's law. Okay, first one, we've got a uh, two kilogram object moving at three meters per second. And at some later time, it's moving at uh, one meter per second. What's our change <clears throat> in kinetic energy? So delta K is K final <clears throat> minus K initial. And what is kinetic energy? One half M V squared.
<clears throat> okay, negative eight joules. So it lost energy, right? It was moving faster at the beginning than it was at the end. So it had more kinetic energy at the beginning than it had at the end. It lost kinetic energy. Its change in kinetic energy was negative. It ended up with less. All right, let's do the next one. Our same two kilogram object moving to the right, three meters per second. And then it's uh, moving to the left at three meters per second. Find the change in kinetic energy. zero, right? <clears throat> it is not a vector quantity. It's a scalar. So the speed did not change. The mass did not change. The kinetic energy did not change. All right. Um, but something happened to this object, right? It was moving to the right at three meters per second. It had to slow down to zero and then turn around and start going in the other direction until it got up to three meters per second, right? Something happened. So let's take a closer look at the motion here. Let's do this one. Two kilogram object moving to the right, three meters per second, and then it's at rest. Okay. Now we've got one that's at rest and moving to the left at three meters per second. This one is positive nine joules. So you see what I did? I took, I took two here, and it's really the sum of these, right? Three and four together make two. You see that? So what did I get? I've got negative nine plus nine is zero. And up here I got zero. So that's why for two, we ended up with zero. Half on the first part of the motion, we had to slow it down to zero. And then on the second part, we had to speed it back up in the opposite direction. So we did negative work and then positive work, but because it started and ended at the same speed, no net work was done on our object because the object's energy did not change. <clears throat> okay, energy is a scalar. It does not depend on direction. Energy is a scalar. Does not depend on direction. So anytime something is moving, it has kinetic energy. It always has positive kinetic energy. There's no negative kinetic energy. Other energies we can have can be negative. 
but uh, kinetic energy cannot. Okay. Let's do, uh, and we don't have time for this one. So when we exert a force on an object, <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, so when we exert a force on an object, right? If that force has some component in the direction of motion, it's doing work on that object. So our force has to have some component in the direction of motion. If the object is moving this way, the force has to have some component in that direction. So uh, FA, FB, FC, this is the displacement of our object. So which, uh, which forces do positive work on our object? So the positive work, FA, is the only one that's doing positive work on our box. It would cause the box's speed to increase if it was the only force acting on our object. Okay, it's doing positive work on it. It would cause the speed to increase. How about FB? FB is doing zero work on our object, it is perpendicular to the direction of motion, right? So uh, we get that cosine 90 degrees. It has no component in the direction of motion. It cannot cause the box to go faster. It cannot cause the box to go slower. It cannot change the speed of the box. It cannot do work on the box. It can change the direction of the, of the velocity, right? It can change the direction, but not the speed. So it's doing no work. And C would be doing negative work, right? It has a component in this direction and the box is going the other direction. So it would be doing negative work on our box. If it was the only force acting on our box, it would be causing the box to slow down. Okay. So one other th point I want to make with uh, work and energy, springs, springs, springs. Springs give us forces that change over distance, right? And because of that, if the force is not constant over the distance, the acceleration is not constant over the distance, right? The acceleration would change as the position changes. So we can't use kinematics equations anymore for all of our kinematics equations are based on constant acceleration. So what do you do? Use energy, right? So anytime you're given a problem. So let's take a look at our favorite problem again. Let's add a spring. As soon as you see that spring in there, you should be thinking this is probably an energy problem. I'm, uh, you know, I might be able to solve for an instantaneous acceleration, right? The, what's the acceleration at this instant? That would be okay, I could ask you that. But an instant later, as soon as those boxes move a little bit, the acceleration is gonna be different, right? Because that spring force changes. So if I asked for a final velocity here, when M2 hits the ground, well, you wouldn't be able to, you, to find the acceleration and then use kinematics equations. You'd have to go right to energy because the acceleration is not constant, okay? All right, we will continue with work and energy next time.
I'll stick around, I'll stop the recording, but I'll stick around to answer questions if you have any questions.